Hey guys, welcome back. It's uh, lesson one of physics 468. That's uh, atomic and nuclear physics, basically the second semester of quantum mechanics. Uh, I want to take a moment to just give a brief overview of the course. We're going to start out looking at uh, what happens when we have more than one particle in the system. That means we have to look into the difference between distinguishable particles and indistinguishable particles and various symmetry effects that those differences make. Um, we're going to talk about perturbation theory, both time-independent perturbation theory and then time-dependent perturbation theory, so we can deal with things like time-dependent interactions and so on that might occur in a system. We'll discuss the variational principle and different uh, techniques for estimating ground state energies and ground state wave functions and in particular we're going to do a lot of work with Monte Carlo techniques and in fact we'll spend a fair amount of time uh, dealing with Monte Carlo simulations of various kinds and computations and learning how to use those techniques to make uh, different kinds of estimates and uh, finally we're going to round out the semester with nuclear and particle physics a little bit of standard model a little bit of nuclear theory, and uh, and apply many of the techniques we've developed through the course of the semester to those topics. So that's the overview of the entire course. Uh, now the other thing I'd like to point out is that we've got a fair amount of flexibility here to do things that you're interested in. So I'm going to be asking you uh, when I get back from my trip to articulate some thoughts on what you're interested in studying of all the topics the atomic molecular nuclear particle physics which topics are most interesting to you and I'll see if we can incorporate as many of those ideas as possible into the course so what happens when you have multiple particles well if you have identical particles identical particles come in two flavors there are bosons and there are fermions uh, the difference between bosons and fermions is that when you swap two bosons in a system that the wave function uh, is the same as it was before the swap. But if you swap two fermions, two identical fermions in a quantum system, the wave func function gets a phase of minus one or a, a phase of pi, you could say. You multiply by e to the i pi, which is minus one, so the wave function has to change sign. And this has dramatic consequences in terms of the behavior of particles that are fermions and particles that are bosons in how they interact with each other and how you build up a quantum system out of those particles. So we'll see how that goes here in a little bit. Bosons are social. They like to get together. Uh, fermions are antisocial. So w one of the consequences of the symmetry requirement is that you can't put two fermions in exactly the same quantum state. They're loners. They only uh, allow one fermion in, in a particular quantum state of the whole system. And so what that means is they tend to avoid one another. Okay, so we'll see how that comes out uh, soon. So um, I want you to imagine we have an infinite square well. We're going to do the infinite square well again, but this time we're going to use, uh, we're going to put particles into the infinite square well that are either bosons or fermions. And what we're going to discover is that, uh, first of all, if you have distinguishable particles in an infinite square well, and the particles don't interact with each other, so there's no potential associated with the particle being near another particle, so these are non-interacting distinguishable particles, then you can get a wave function for the pair of them as simply the product of the wave functions of the individual particles. This is in the case that they're distinguishable. But if they're indistinguishable, then you have two different wave functions. One is the bosonic wave function where you have to write the wave function out uh, with particle 1 in state n1 and particle 2 in state n2 and then write it out again add to that another term that enforces the symmetry requirement that if you swap the two particles you get the same wave function so notice that the second term in this sum has n2 for particle 1 and n1 for particle 2 and the consequence of that is if you swap x1 and x2, the first term becomes the second term, and the second term becomes the first term, but the overall wave function doesn't change. So this would be a bosonic or symmetric form of an infinite square well 
uh, wave function. And if you have fermions, you've got to cook it up in such a way that when you swap x1 and x2, in other words, you swap the positions of the two particles in the wave function, you get the same wave function back but with a minus sign. So notice that the second term here has a minus sign, and that enforces the anti-symmetry requirement that fermions have to satisfy. So what happens to a fermion state if n1 is equal to n2? I'll let you think about that. Look at that expression, see if you can't figure it out. Maybe we can talk about it in class. All right, I want to take a minute now to show you the demo for the first computing project, which is uh, a lot like computing project 8 from last semester, the two-dimensional infinite square well, except now it's a one-dimensional infinite square well with two particles. But you'll find that much of the code that you developed for Project 8 last semester will immediately work for this project this semester because the two problems are actually quite similar. Alright, so here we are looking at the code for Computing Project 1. Um, this is very similar to Computing Project 8. You'll notice in the handout I make a lot of uh, references to Computing Project 8. And so um, basically 90% of the code is identical. The things that have changed are that now instead of using x and y, we're using x1 and x2 because in this project we're talking about a one-dimensional infinite square well in space but with two distinguishable particles or two indistinguishable particles in it depending on how you set the initial conditions. The way the program works is if you want to use bosons you um, set bosons to 1 and fermions to 0 like that. If you want to use fermions you set fermions to 1 and bosons to 0 and if you want to use distinguishable particles you set them both to 0. That's the plan. Uh, let me just show you here. Let's just go ahead and use distinguishable particles to see how it works. The other thing is there's two sets of initial conditions here that I've pre-set up for you. The uh, This set that I just uncommented has the probability of being between 0 and half of A, half of the well, width equal to a constant for both particles. So both particles are equally likely to be found anywhere between 0 and A over 2. Um, at the beginning. Now you're going to discover that that actually doesn't work very well for fermions because you'd be trying to put both fermions in the same state. So there's another initial condition here that you can use for fermions um, where particle 1 is between 0 and A over 4 and particle 2 is between A over 4 and A over 2. And that actually works better for fermions. And you can see that you can do that for bosons as well. But I wanted to start out simple. Um, anyway, the, uh, the project is almost exactly identical. There's one other big difference. In, when you create the basis states, the basis states are different for fermions, bosons, and distinguishable particles. Uh, it's all described in the handout, but you should notice the major difference here is that the fermionic and bosonic basis states are uh, symmetrized when they're constructed. So they're automatically constructed to have the correct symmetry properties for fermions, bosons, and in this case distinguishable particles have no particular symmetry, so you can just write those out as the product of particle 1 in state 1 and particle 2 in state 2. And uh, energies are calculated in exactly the same way, and the one part I haven't given you in the starter code that I give you is the time evolution, but of course time evolution works exactly the same way as it did for uh, last semester, so nothing nothing terribly profound there. Let's go ahead and run the program and you can see how it goes. Um, basically, let's see, why didn't that... Oh, there we go. Okay, so we get a graph, we get a 3D view. So remember the uh, the idea here is that this direction is particle 1, coordinate. This direction is particles 2, particle 2's coordinate, x-coordinate, and you can see that the uniform probability density of being uh, in the lower left-hand corner. If I turn on the time, you'll see that the uh, wave function evolves in time. I want to remind you the way these cylinders work. Um, these cylinders show a complex amplitude at every 
point in space at different times. The height of the cylinder is the real part. Notice that uh, the height can become negative, so you can have a negative real part. Um, and the radius of the cylinder is the imaginary part, but the imaginary part could be negative, and it's hard to see a negative radius, so what we do is we switch the color. If the imaginary part is positive, it's red. If the imaginary part is negative, it's blue. So you can see the imaginary part, the real part, uh, and you can see that this thing evolves in time. Where the cylinders are big, there's a big probability of finding the particle. Where the cylinders are small, there's a small probability, and so on. And uh, you'll recognize this graph from, this is sort of looks like the graph we had um, on the slide before we got one to the demo. Anyway, um, that's kind of how it works. You can fiddle with the initial conditions set up in the uh, program, change the particles to bosons, to fermions, and change the initial wave function by uncommenting or commenting these two lines. And uh, while the code is very similar to Project 8, and I expect you guys all did Project 8 or maybe remember Project 8, um, if you have any questions about the code, please don't hesitate to, to consult with me because I want to make sure you guys understand how it all goes. And, uh, and that's it. Okay, I just remembered there's one other thing I must show you quickly. I'm going to go down and set the initial conditions up so that fermions can work. I'm going to change the particle type to bosons and just very briefly point out that when I run this thing, um, this is the boson case. You can see that there's no restriction on having bosons right next to each other. Notice that uh, if you look at the thing, this is this diagonal here is x1 equals x2, and, and there are, there's lots of amplitude for x1 and x2 to be equal to each other, which means the bosons can be right up next to each other. If I change this to fermions, on the other hand, and run it, now we have an anti-symmetric state, and I want you to notice that there's there's kind of an exclusion zone there. X1 can never equal X2, and that's because the basis states for the fermions are explicitly anti-symmetric, and that means they have a zero there along the middle, and so the fermions can never see each other, and that has uh, significant implications. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that quickly. Okay, so I want to point out, I, you see these graphs I have here on this page, and I didn't explain what they are. Um, these are the graphs of the probability of finding both particles in the lower, in the left half of the infinite square well. In the three cases that the two particles are distinguishable, that they are bosons, and that they're fermions. And you'll notice that, you know, there's sort of qualitative similarity here between the three cases. But I want to emphasize that the details of the exact time dependence of the three different cases are different. And that's because the fact that you have a boson or a fermion or distinguishable particles has measurable consequences that uh, mean that's important. So you have to pay attention to that and understand the distinction between those cases. Uh, when you finish your project, you'll be able to run the thing using bosons, fermions, or distinguishable particles and see these exact same graphs and answer some of the questions that I cooked up for you to try to hopefully deepen your understanding of what's going on. I want to finish out today, this is not a long set of slides today, but I want to finish out by going over a section of the text. Uh, Griffiths describes something called the exchange force. And I just wanted to sort of redo his calculation using Dirac notation, just to point out that you don't necessarily have to write out all these integrals explicitly, just kind of see what's going on. The idea is to compute the expectation value of the square difference between the position of the two particles. In the case of distinguishable particles, you just use the distinguishable ket AB. Now, the fact that it's written AB, the order is important. It means that particle 1, the first particle, is in state A, and particle B, particle 2, the second particle, is in state B. So we have particle 1, that's the first slot, particle 2 is the second slot, and this ket would say that particle 1 is in state A, particle 2 is in state B. 
And in that situation, you can compute this expectation value by simply sandwiching the expression x1 minus x2 squared between the two, between the bra and the ket, AB. Um, you can expand the binomial and uh, actually calculate the whole thing fairly directly. Now the fact x1 means that it, we're talking about the particle in slot 1. x2 means we're talking about the particle in slot 2. So when we go to evaluate these expectation values, the first term only involves the A state because it's x1 and that means it's the first slot and A is the first slot. Um, the, the first term, the B's, just uh, hit each other because there's no x2 in that first term in the expression. On the other hand, the second term is all about slot 2 and so it's the expectation value of x in the state corresponding to the second slot. And finally, the last term is the expectation value of x in the first slot and the expectation value of x in the second slot. So it turns out to be the product of the expectation value of x in state A and the expectation value of x in state B. We can march ahead here and uh, rewrite that. Notice that B on B is 1 and A on A is 1, so those bras and kets just sort of evaporate, and you get the expectation value of x in state A, the expectation value of x squared in state A, plus the expectation value of x squared in state B, minus twice the expectation value of x in state A, times the expectation value of x in state B. This would be the <coughs> expectation value of x minus, x1 minus x2 squared in the distinguishable case. I want to notice that uh, if we had put particle 1 in state B and particle 2 in state A, we would have gotten the same answer because you can see that if you swap A and B in this expression, it doesn't change anything. So um, it doesn't. We, which particle is in state A and which particle is in state B is not relevant in terms of computing this particular expectation value. All that matters is that those, that's the two different states they're in. Okay. So um, let's talk about indistinguishable particles. What's the difference here? Well, for indistinguishable particles, we've got to use a symmetrized or anti-symmetrized state for bosons or fermions, respectively. So if it's a boson, you get the plus sign. And if it's a fermion, you get the minus sign. But uh, you can write the whole thing out as just uh, AB plus or minus BA over root 2. So then what happens when we go to compute this same expectation value? Well, it gets a little more complicated because uh, psi sub i now uh, has two pieces. And since there's a psi sub i in the left-hand bra and a psi sub i in the right-hand ket, we end up with many terms, and not to mention the fact that the binomial has three terms. So there's a lots of terms we have to evaluate. We can expand the binomial again and rewrite this as the first term plus the second term minus two times that last bit. But each of these now has four pieces. There's uh, because we have to expand all these bras and kets out. So it gets fairly complicated. Let's take the first term, x1 squared, and see how that comes out. We'll go ahead and expand that whole spiel. I want you to notice it's uh, similar to the thing we had before, except now we have to be a little careful about keeping track of which slot corresponds to which number. Notice that uh, the fact that we're talking about x1 means that it's only the first slot that counts in any of these terms. So we get x1 in state a squared, and then b on b gives us 1. And then the last term we have x1 squared in, in state b, and a on a gives us 1. But notice in the two middle terms, uh, those guys go away because we get a on b and b on a. And I'm assuming in this case that the two states, a and b, are different. Um, if the two states are the same, then uh, we only have to worry about the boson case. And we can talk about that later. But I, for, for the moment, let's just imagine they're different. And, uh, and notice that. Uh, the same thing works out for particle 2, x squared of particle 2, because uh, it's a, basically the same algebra. You just have to plug in the other state. But, but when we, the last term, the one where x1 times, we get x1 times x2, it's a little different. So we should work that one out in.
So uh, let's go ahead and expand that all out. And you'll see that uh, we have a new kind of term here that didn't exist before. We still have the x in state A and the x in state B. But now we have these cross terms where we have x taken between states A and B and x taken between states B and A. Now remember, these, these uh, states are all stationary states and x is an observable, so that means these uh, these inner products have to be real numbers. The expectation values have to be real, even though they're two different states. So um, basically, uh, a on x on b and b on x on a are going to end up being the same thing. And uh, so we can simplify this quite a lot using the same kind of notation we had before. Um, Notice that when the whole thing comes out, it looks similar to what we had before, but we've got an extra term. The first three terms in the result are the same thing we had for the distinguishable particles, but this last term um, is due to the fact that the two particles are identical. And notice that the, the sign there is important. If they're bosons, we take the upper sign. If they're fermions, we take the lower sign. And the uh, the upper sign means that for bosons, the particles are closer together than they would be if they were distinguishable. And for fermions, it means the average distance between the two particles is greater. So they, they avoid one another more than they would otherwise. And the degree of avoidance has to do with the size of this so-called so exchange integral, the AXB, um, where the two states are both acting on the displacement operator. But uh, we kind of saw that in the demo. I hope you sort of recognized it in the demo, but also you can see it works out here mathematically. And uh, I also hope that you found this notation a little bit easier to, to see and to understand than the, uh, the detailed integral version that was in the text. But uh, we'll see you guys. I'm not going to be here next time. I'll be back on Friday, but uh, hopefully you guys are being well taken care of. Uh, there will be another tutorial on Wednesday for you to work through. The tutorial for today is going to involve um, fermions in uh, three-dimensional infinite square well situations. Anyway, talk to you soon.